Welcome back, everyone. Um, I hope you've all had a good refresh and a nice, nice lunch. Um, we're now going to shift our attention a little bit to Emerging Markets Asia, um, an area where we've seen a lot of growth economically, technologically, and also in the responsible investment space. Um, you know, when you think about Asia, uh, you know, you think about China, you think about India, um, but there's also a lot of other smaller countries, a lot of, a lot of other pockets of value um, in, in that region. Um, and I'd like to welcome Lisa Lim onto the stage to, to touch on, uh, on some of those themes and some of those areas. Um, now, when I was reading Lisa's profile, I wanted to impart a couple of facts about her. Um, so I also forgot to mention she manages the Prusik Asia Fund, which is a key, key thing to mention there. Um, but I found it really hard to actually choose what I wanted to tell you about her because she has such an impressive profile. Um, so I've picked out a couple of things, one of which is that she's done um, an engineering degree and PhD uh, at Cambridge University. And I also just found out that she didn't start learning English until she started her degree. So pretty phenomenal thing there. Um, and then she also speaks five languages. Um, and for somebody who lived in France for two years and just about managed to um, have a conversation in French at the end of it, you know, that's absolutely phenomenal. Um, also, you know, I've been a fund researcher for a long time. And I think if you're able to speak to companies management in the language that, that they converse, you pick up nuances, you can really understand the companies that you're speaking to. So um, that obviously puts Lisa in, in great stead to manage a, an Asian portfolio. So thank you very much, Lisa. Oh, thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, I want to thank the organizers for having me in this think tank. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes talking about sustainable investing in Asia. What are the challenges that we are seeing on the ground? Uh, what can we do about it as capital allocators, as investors? Can we do something and at the same time make some money? So in the next 20 minutes, I'll talk about share our views from the ground. And I'll do that through using two case studies. And I hope to bring live to you how these two companies, in two separate ways, in two different ways, are able to create a lot of impact to the societies and in the environment that they operate, and at the same time generate shareholder returns. Now, the first slide is about our investing philosophy. What's our underpinning investing philosophy? You can see from the Venn diagram that there's a small area of overlap between performance and purpose. It's a very small area indeed. And this is our starting point. We believe that we can actually pursue the dual objective of performance and purpose. We do this through huge focus on governance, and the quality of management of the companies that we picked. We pay particular attention on valuation. We like to buy companies below its intrinsic value, and we leave a margin of safety. And we adopt an absolute return mindset, hoping to protect capital for all our investors. And with this underpinning philosophy, we go and search for companies across Asia in China, in India, and in many other parts of Asia. The future is Asia, according to McKinsey. Um, Asia, home to 5 billion people, 60% of world's population. It is also projected that by 2050, Asia will generate the dominant share of global GDP. By 2030, Asia will represent the largest global middle class. And this middle class, this segment, will continue to grow in terms of wealth and will continue to be a key contributor for global and regional growth. One notable observation that we've observed in the last 20 years in Asia is that we're increasingly seeing the emergence of homegrown innovators with purposeful solution and purposeful business model coming out from Asia. You can see on the chart here, 
on my left hand of the chart that China has recently taken over the US in terms of publication count in global top journals. Now behind this chart outside China, we are seeing India and South Korea now positioning themselves in the top 10 of this very prestigious global league table. Now, I have been a lifelong student of innovation. I spent a huge part of my career in academia studying innovation. I wrote about innovation. 20 years ago, I was writing my PhD thesis on innovation, and I also taught innovation. With that background, I ask two questions all the time in my, this new current role. When I go to Asia to see companies, when I talk to management of companies, and I ask myself, actually, why do firms innovate? It's quite a basic question, but a hugely important question. If firms are doing well, why change? Now, the second question is, which is very critical, is how do they innovate? In the last 20 years, I have observed that there is a distinct difference between the approach to innovation in Asia, if we contrast it to the developed world. The one consistent characteristic is that Asian companies and institutions always have a very clear goal with a very clear timeline. This is in contrast to the serendipitous nature and the blue sky approach of the Western world. Now, it's not saying that one model is better than the other, but the very important implication here is that the outcomes from this innovation in Asia is that they tend to be commercially viable quicker. They tend to have been de-risked from an investment perspective. They tend to also have been funded by non-profit institutions, sometimes by public sector. The innovation in Asia can come in many different forms. And I think innovation sometimes has created a lot of confusion. And if we go back to basic, innovation can take the form of product innovation the form of process innovation of which we know that Asia companies, especially Taiwanese and Korean, are very good at in the field of, for example, semiconductor. And also, let's talk about business model innovation. It's about how can you do business in a slightly different way so that you can best serve the community and to optimize the returns of your shareholders. Some innovations we see can be incremental, some disruptive, and some even breakthrough. So with this hypothesis in mind, that innovation coming out from Asia is more commercially viable, we then look for companies that are offering solutions to the challenges that we are facing currently in the region and globally. So, I would like to talk about the challenges that we are facing in terms of, in the context of E, S, and G. In the environment segment, Asia accounts for 50% of global emission. It's a very sad fact, one that possibly is hard to reverse in the short term, is that coal is still the main source of electricity in Asia. One might argue that can we cut, that, cut this off tomorrow, but on the flip side, if we do that, we will leave many in the areas of, say, Philippines, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, people who are just barely surviving at the poverty line. We would have cut them out from electricity. So it will be a global humanity crisis. The demand for cooling will continue to increase. I just landed back from Hong Kong and Taiwan. And the number of, it was really warm there. And it is inevitable that in the short term, cooling solutions need to be improved. On the social side, there is still a huge amount of work to be done 
in social infrastructure, basic providence, basic infrastructure. For example, in India, we have half a hospital bed, but 1,000 population. In contrast, Germany has 14 times that. Poverty and inclusion is still an issue. 51% of population in Indonesia has no bank account. 29% of children in India drop out of school before completing primary school. Corporate governance standards are still very much inconsistent across Asia. What we are seeing now is original first generation founders handing over businesses to the second generation and sometimes to the third generation. It can work both ways. One could argue that it's better for the original founder to be running the ship, but at the same time, it's an opportunity for the second, third generation to professionalize the board and the executive management. So it's a bit mixed in the area of governance. It's interesting also that recently, Hong Kong Exchange, Singapore Exchange, Bursa Malaysia are coming up with rules for listing and encouraging companies to provide better disclosure and to adopt global standard of corporate governance code. So some of you might have seen this. This is a Chinese character pronounced as Wei Xi. It is made up of two standalone characters. The first character acknowledge danger and the second character points to opportunity. And I believe that in every crisis, well, being Chinese, uh, lies the seed of opportunity if we look hard enough. And there's always a role for everyone to play. So what are the opportunities? In the spirit of Weiji, I would like to map the opportunities on the challenges that I talk about. We see in the area of environment, structural growing demand, in the area of clean energy, in the area of energy transition solutions, and in the area of cooling systems. And Asia is a powerhouse for this. We know that enough article has been written in FT, in The Economist, about the technology progress that the Koreans and the Chinese has made in the EV space. On the social side, which, this, uh, which has less breast attention, is that there's definitely a need for capital in the area of private healthcare, in the area of financial services, fintech, and the area of infrastructure, connectivity, data center, as these cities develop. In the area of governance, it's interesting that the new generation in Asia have actually gone from one end to being extreme capitalism, a capitalist, to wanting to find purpose in what they do. Unemployment rate in China is high, over 20%, and this new generation flooded with inheritance wants to find purpose in what they do. So we are seeing emergence of more meaningful business model to try to solve society's problems. Now, we, we like to distill these opportunities, which are vast across all the countries in Asia, more than 10 countries, which are all very diverse and very different, into seven key themes for you. So, and which are immediately investable, immediately implementable. First, clean energy. Second, energy transition. Third, connectivity. Fourth, financial inclusion, responsible lending. Fifth, serving the underserved, addressing the needs of the marginalized and just at those at the poverty line. In terms of food, in terms of services, healthcare solutions, and of course, those who are innovating, some of them providing solutions at the global level, emerging as global winners. So now I'm going to share the first case study with you and hope that this will bring it to life to you, how we can go back to our underpinning philosophical position, starting point, to make money, 
as we invest in purposeful companies which are creating huge impact to the society. Bank Rocket Indonesia with a mission to enable fulfillment of purpose amongst the poorest. So for those of you who are less familiar with Indonesia, I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking about the backdrop of the country. Indonesia has a population of more than 200 million, projected to reach 300 million very soon. It has a very young demographic driving growth. Majority of Indonesia's population is below 45 years old. GDP per capita is expected to reach 8,000 US dollars. The country is rich in natural resources, having the largest reserve in nickel, and is uniquely positioned to benefit from the growth in EV supply chain. Now, 77% of the population is still on the bank. Less known to us is that this interesting fact from the UN, I'm quoting that 60 million, there are 60 million micro and ultra micro enterprises in Indonesia, which are driving the nice GDP chart on the left. And these 60 million micro enterprises accounts for a staggering 60% of Indonesia's GDP, employs 97% of the population. So it gives us a picture where it's actually very heavy at the bottom of the pyramid. And the corporate there and the companies that are only addressing the very top, the 0.01% of the society. So there is still a lot of work to be done. Bank Rakyat is the oldest bank in Indonesia, tracing its route back to 1895. And this company has remarkable and has been innovating its business model in the last 128 years. The bank started microfinancing after the war in 1948 and is now the largest bank in Indonesia. You can also see from here that it's six times larger in this segment relative to its second competitor. The business model is unique. First of all, it has a purposeful business model, which is aim is to lift millions out of poverty and to advance financial inclusion and to improve financial literacy. This is very much aligned, not only to the UN, but aligned to the Indonesian government's hope. Therefore, it enjoys government support. Over the years, the, co the company has, has developed a branch network of 8,000 branches, and more importantly, 600,000 loan officers who are branchless. But these are specialized loan officers who are specialized to communicate, to handhold, and to work with those who are illiterate, let alone financially literate in a responsible manner. Because the alternatives for these people is loan shark. So it is really plugging the gap. And because of the unique position, the company continue to gain market share and is projected that it will reach 70% market share very soon. So this is the financials of Bank Rakyat, a snapshot. You can see, to start here, you can see that the microfinancing book is a lot more profitable than the corporate book. Now, why is this? Because of three simple reasons. It has superior net interest margin. And more remarkably, which I will talk about more, is it has very resilient asset quality. So provision, per, uh, provision divided by asset, 1.1%. And if we compare that to a non-SOE corporate, it's 3%. And how do they achieve this? These two pictures will give us some answers. So I'll start with the bottom picture here. So this is a picture sent to me by the company. In fact, I've known the chairman of this bank for 20 years uh, when I worked in Indonesia in 2001 over 20 years. 
we were together, we were analysts together in the Boston Consulting Group. And this is a typical gathering, weekly gathering, where the borrowers come together to meet the loan officers. Now, the loan officers has two objectives. First is to collect weekly repayment, and second, to play a mentoring role, to make sure that everything is all right. They come together to borrow collectively as a community. They are accountable to each other. Many of these women has no opportunity. They come with their babies, and they are accountable for each other, and they need the moral support. And because of this, if one chooses to default, the rest of the group will be impacted. And this is the fabric and the core that holds this business model together, which is extremely hard to replicate. The top picture is a picture of a Somali entrepreneur, micro-entrepreneur, and the loan officer here is showing her a very basic app a digital tool that she can use to manage her working capital so that she can know when the cash is in, when the cash is out, and to help her to run her business. And again, this is an example of, to me, you know, this company is continuing innovating, not like, you know, creating the best app in the world, but creating an app that is useful, that is meaningful, and that is suitable for its customers. So I'm going to play a video which was sent to me by the company. And the, the company was so excited when I told them that I'm going to talk about them in this conference. Nama Solikin, lahir di Desa Tanjung Suma, Kecamatan Purbolinggo, Lampung Timur. Sejak tahun 2008, saya memberanikan diri untuk berbisnis telur. Dan telur memberikan penghidupan untuk saya, untuk istri, untuk anak-anak saya, tapi juga orang-orang yang ada di sekitar saya sebagai besar penduduk yang tinggal di sini menggantungkan hidupnya pada telur. Namun terkadang kehidupan yang kami jalani tidak mulus. Ada kala di mana harga telur turun dan tidak cukup untuk memberikan penghidupan bagi kami jangankan untuk menambah kembali stok bisa menjual yang ada pun sudah cukup bagi kami karena sudah tidak ada lagi uang untuk menambah stok terima kasih Pari yang sudah memberikan kesempatan untuk menggerakkan ekonomi dan bisnis telur saya ya Alhamdulillah benar-benar saya itu begitu ada Pari saya benar-benar sangat-sangat terbantu Terutama karena itu istilahnya ada dana talangan. Dana talangan itu istilahnya dana darurat, dana yang sewaktu bisa kita cairkan. Jadi dengan, dengan adanya aplikasi pari itu eh, karena ini masih baru, eh, mudah-mudahan ke depan itu mungkin bisa semuanya kalau bisa pakai pari. Biar orang-orang yang udah pakai pari itu eh, istilahnya nggak ribet begitu adanya aplikasi pari yang tadinya pembayaran agak kurang lancar sekarang bisa langsung lancar. Perkenalkan saya Jenny Sulistiani, Ketua Pinsar Petelur Nasional Wilayah Lampung. Saya bersyukur BRI hadir dengan program parinya dan kami di Lampung ini menjadi pionir untuk program pari ini. Saya berharap dengan adanya pari ini tentu memperkuat eksistensi peternak petelur dan juga peternak dilatih untuk masuk di dalam era digital ini sehingga peternak-peternak ini tidak ketinggalan tetapi semakin berdaya, semakin kuat dan semakin merasakan kehadiran pemerintah melalui BRI dan program pari ini. Terima kasih. We can see how real positive impact is being created in societies through a quality business model with a strong competitive mode. But what is more interesting, if you look at this chart, is that the company has compounded and has generated 400% total shareholder return in dollars term in the last decade. So now I'm going to move on to the second case study. And the reason for showing you a different case study is to show you the diverse set of opportunities that we can find in Asia.
We talk about Indonesia, we talk about financial inclusion, we talk about poverty. Cochlear is a highly innovative company, global leader in pediatric ear implant, with a corporate mission of we help people hear and be heard. Cochlear is born out, started by a scientist with one simple but important goal in mind, to solve a pressing issue very personal to him, which was a solution to cure his father's deafness. Through innovating purposefully with a clear goal, today, Cochlear commands 60% of market share in pediatric ear implant. It has made enable millions of babies born deaf to hear again. You can see also that the total shareholder returns is almost 300% in the last 10 years. Again, a video. I remember the day the music returned. And the laughter. Making new friends. And when she heard my voice for the first time, it was the moment I realized there was something that would bring sound to my world. Made possible by world-class technology. Started by one man's vision to bring sound back to his deaf father. Today it's a brand people trust. Promising a lifetime of support. That's what makes me confident about her future and why I feel connected. Focused on life. Because now, I can hear. I hope I've shown you, if I go back to the Venn diagram, it is possible to be in the area of overlap, to create performance through picking purposeful companies. Now, just to conclude, what does this, this mean to us? Well, Asia is always intertwined with the global economies. Asia faces global challenges like everyone does in climate crisis, but Asia is also face with very localized challenges, as we've seen in the case of Bank Rakia. There is a market failure in capital deployment in many parts of Asia. Public investments often inadequate, and there is a need for private capital to plug the gap. Now, the opportunities is there, is vast, to deploy capital in a purposeful manner. And when you pick companies carefully and look hard enough, there are opportunities with huge returns from a risk-adjusted uh, perspective, very attractive. So these are some of the areas, some of the companies that we've picked up from our research across Asia. And yeah, I will stop here and take questions.